all protocols observed. We have, I was speaking with some members of the audience before we started the session about the themes they're interested in hearing about, uh, opportunities in Africa, trade, sustainability. Uh, we're gonna hear all about those topics, all about something else. Um, I've been hearing a lot about something called Brexit. So we have a, a very wide range of topics to discuss. But before we open our minds to these ideas, which I hope are, are challenging and, and new ways of thinking about uh, Africa, let's open our ears with a musical performance all the way from India, Kirti Rudder. Good morning to all. I would like to first thank the organizers and Barry in particular for giving me this opportunity to present before you three songs, which is in line with why we are here today, the common good. We invoke Lord Ganesha, who is depicted with an elephant head who rides a, ha uh, who rides a rat. He symbolizes the immense knowledge that can be ridden with swiftness, agility, and being street smart. The second song is about Lord Rama, who symbolizes righteousness, beauty, and, uh, and upholds the law, uh, the rule of law. The final song goes with the theme of our gathering today, to do good, to be compassionate, in addition to being competitive and progress and development. Thank you. Thank you. 
Sometimes we talk about shared prosperity. Other times we talk about collective growth or inclusive growth. These are all spin-offs from the theme, the common good. Our actions in respect of achieving a common good has been instinctive, it's been ingrained in us by custom, tradition, and centuries of socialization. Human society has socialized us to seek the common good. And then um, I like to quote from my favorite English poet, uh, John Donne, in his essay titled Unless You Are Man. And he says, No man is an island. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. And he goes on to say, Any man's death diminishes me because I'm involved in mankind. And let, therefore, never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. His poem is a poignant reminder to us that we are all connected. All of us in this room and all our countries are all connected to the main. We are connected as a world and we are connected as the strings of humanity. The formation of regional and global bodies have governance, galvanized us around common forces to pursue the common good. The MDGs have been the most successful anti-poverty movement in the history of mankind, cutting poverty by half and undernourishment by half between 1990 and 2015. And this was done under the auspices of the United Nations. And so the world coming together under the auspices of the United Nations worked for a common good in achieving the targets of the Millennium Development Goals. And we were able to cut hunger by half, cut poverty by half. These have been succeeded by the Sustainable Development Goals. That is another example of us coming together and trying to achieve a common good. Another example of achieving a common good is the Paris Climate Change Agreement, where mankind realizes that our survival is collective, and therefore we must come together and reach agreements that will make our planet habitable going forward into the future. And that's how come the Paris Climate Change Agreement was signed. Even though somebody calls, called Trump does not really meant him. He's looking to reverse the agreement. Notwithstanding the progress we have made collectively, the most powerful countries have often voted their country's interests above all else. And the less powerful communities of people and countries of the world have often been left behind. America first. The Trumpian mantra is a clear sign that in spite of our desire for a fairer and just world, there are ideological postings that threaten the ethos of achieving a common good. America's withdrawal from the climate change agreement, the Mexican border wall, looming tariff walls are all threatening to unravel the world order we have become used to. An invisible yet palpable walls of obstruction acts as barricades, separating and neatly placing each country at the extreme end of binary oppositions, north versus south, east versus west, rich versus poor, developed versus developing. In the end, therefore, instead of the common good, we are separated by the common distance. And there is a price to pay for this. The famous American poet Robert Frost put it succinctly in his writing, Mending Wall. Before I built a wall, I would ask to know, Frost said, what I was walling in or walling out. You need to think deeply about the purpose of that wall you are building. Are you really keeping anything in or you are truly keeping something out? In the regard to the common good, is the walls and barriers, both physical and mental, that we have begun erecting throughout the world and in our minds. And ladies and gentlemen, some historic walls have come down. Remember the Berlin Wall. No longer exists. Remember the Iron Curtain. All in the heavy days when we believed that at the end of the Cold War, 
was going to deal the massive dividend with the taking down of the iron curtain. The savings gained from the end of the arms race, we were told, was enough to assure prosperity for every person on the globe. Instead of the peace dividend and the renewed commitment to work for the common good, new walls are springing up, including President Trump's estimated 33 billion 900 mile long, 30 feet high Mexico wall. Other countries duly admitted to the EU, like Hungary, are also building border fences spanning hundreds of kilometers. And ladies and gentlemen, the most dangerous walls are not the physical walls we see, but the walls that we build in our minds. The recent rise in populism and xenophobia around the world has erected mental barriers of wars that are inimical to the common good. It is factual that the spectre painted in the minds of many Britons of hordes of Muslim refugees pouring into Britain convinced them to vote for Brexit. Fear is a basic human instinct and motivates us to act in ways that may not be conducive to the common good. It makes us erect walls or barriers to keep out what we fear. But can these walls truly keep everything out or in? As president, I had a first-hand experience of the nature of fear and walls and their effects during the outbreak of the deadly Ebola, Ebola virus disease in some countries in West Africa. When the outbreak began, the initial, perhaps panic-driven response of many countries in Africa and the rest of the world was to close their borders and airspace to travelers from the three affected countries. My country, Ghana, was one of the few countries that following the implementation of strict medical protocols did not shut our borders for travel to and from the affected countries. Ironically, the disease skipped Ghana and rather spread to places whose borders had been closed to persons from the affected countries. Indeed, the disease traveled past Ghana into Nigeria, <laughs> travel past the Atlantic and the Mediterranean oceans into America and Europe. By opening our Ghana's borders and allowing our country to be used as a UN staging post for the movement of drugs and logistics in the fight against Ebola, rather than choosing the easier option of putting up walls or closing our borders and minding our own business, we were able, with the aid of the UN and the international community, to halt the scourge of Ebola. And I believe, I believe that that was a struggle for the common good. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot speak of the common good if we turn our backs to our neighbors in their times of need. We cannot turn our backs to oppression in any form, to genocide or ethnic cleansing. We must fight and defeat racism, bigotry, and xenophobia. We must intercede for humanity no matter the cost. The fate of the Rohingya Muslims is a scar on the conscience of the world. I thought when Srebrenica happened and Rwanda genocide happened, the world said never again. And yet we sit and watch deep violence inflicted on many people across the world. Our common good entails the creation of opportunities for Africa, so that our youth do not hazard all to seek a better life across the Sahara and the Mediterranean. Africa is moving forward, not as fast as we would wish, but definitely there is something happening on the continent. The political developments in Africa are moving at a breakneck, breakneck, breakneck speed. I have had the experience of being voted out of office as an incumbent. I have witnessed champions of Lord President Yaya Jami. And I, I, I somehow got involved in that process. I, uh, our elections were the seventh, actually, Gambia was the first. And uh, for the first time, Yaya Jami had lost the election. And he conceded and congratulated the incoming president. 
And then a week later, he woke up from the spell that had been cast on him. <laughs> and realized the reputation of what he had done, and he counted his concession. <laughs> and uh, we had just had our election on December 7th. And I had much to and called and congratulated my opponents and considered the election. And so I guess that was the reason why when Edwards decided to send a delegation to convince the Army to roll back uh, the retraction of his concession, I was added to that delegation. I think it was myself, President Buhari, and Ms. Koruma, and uh, Johnson Selly. And so we went to Gambia, and something funny happened. The first time we were unsuccessful, uh, when he went to his, we went to his head, after reviewing the election, he realizes that the way he realizes is in many places. And so we decided to file a petition against the election. And I think in Gambia does not have a sitting Supreme Court. They compile the cases and then they bring Supreme Court judges from different common counties and then they put the cases before them and then they have the case for a period and then they adjourn. And so it meant that the common had to help and the court had to help to get judges to adjudicate the case. And so he said he was not going to concede unless the case was looked at. So we went back and got it to work on And they sent us on a second mission. I'm sure the reason why I was added to these missions was to serve as a good example to President Jamie. Because when I could tell him, well, I'm in both, we all lost this thing. Let's, let's walk and uh, hand over peace to my friend. He, he didn't listen. Um, the president elect is the president now, President Barrow, I remember. On the first meeting, he was reluctant to leave Gambia because he said his security was in the hands of the Gambian people. We thought that uh, his security he was at risk personally uh, if he continued to stay, but he refused to leave. And by the second time we went, uh, we asked if he was still comfortable with staying, and he um, said no. Um, he felt his life was threatened, and so he would be happy to uh, uh, leave Gambia. And then he was narrating to us something. And when I went and I met him, I mentioned it to him. Um, they had put sandbags around his house to protect him. And then there were soldiers in combat gear with leaves on their helmets and all that. And so, when we went to the I said, oh, the president elect is afraid for his safety because you surrounded his house with uh, soldiers. And uh, he said, yeah, I'll put soldiers around his house to protect him. But if anything happens to him, I know you did, and that's what you say, that I, I was responsible for hurting him, so I need to make sure he's safe. And I said, the president, the only problem is that the guns the soldiers are holding are pointing at the man's house. <laughs> 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 they have put some guys around the house. And you saw the guns pointing to people approaching the house. The guns were all pointing at the house. You know. So then you open the window, you saw a soldier with a gun looking at you, you know, through the gun sights. You know, but uh, this is all part of the, you know, public landscape and things that have happened recently. Mugabe has been eased out of power. Zuma was compelled to resign. Famous footballer of Hongya has become president of Liberia. Sierra Leone is facing a runoff uh, election with the opposition candidates here leading in the first round of poll. Uhuru was re elected. And later, a people's president swore himself in. And today they are ah. meeting and burying the hatchet. Ah. Kagame was retained in office. And so many, many things are, are happening in Africa very fast. But all this points to the democratic consolidation that is occurring on the continent. And I believe that the enabling environment for common good to occur is when you have a stable democratic society. It unleashes the creative of the talents of the people and helps to propel growth. 
I use my own country as an example. Ghana is not perfect. But I can say that in the period of the Fourth Republic from 1992 to date, our country has seen the longest period of sustained economic growth and expansion than in any other comparable period of our history. Yeah. And so it means that democratic consolidation and stability is a necessary ingredient for achieving the common good and common prosperity of our people. Our people are not willing to be led passively and are demanding accountability from our leaders. There must be a democratic dividend, and our people want to feel the benefits of that democratic dividend now. Waiting to vote every four or five years as the political term of office may be is not enough for them anymore. Africa faces a huge bulge. How do we accelerate African economies in order that we are creating growth that is inclusive? and ensuring a shared prosperity for all our people. We cannot achieve this in the 54 little states that we currently have. And that is why our predecessors, that is the first generation after independence, pushed for the unity of the African continent. And my own president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, was a strong advocate for this. Because he said, as 54 little independent countries, how much can we achieve on our own? with all those barriers to trade amongst our countries. I cannot move agricultural products from Ghana to Sudan without increasing the cost. And yet I can easily move agricultural products from Ghana to, into the European market. Easier than I can move products into Sudan. And so these are some of the barriers that we need to take out. We need to open the borders for our people. Goods and service, and for goods and services to move seamlessly across the continent. We must leverage Africa's size and market for the common good of all Africans. I implemented the protocol for the issuance of visas on arrival for all African passport holders. We have gone to the AU and discussed this. And uh, I thought that we were going to implement it at that AU session. Uh, just when we're moving forward, some countries got to the and said, no, we should postpone it to the next uh, AU meeting. And so Ghana decided, and I was present then, unilaterally, that um, we're going to go ahead and implement it. And so in July 2016, we introduced a visa free, uh, uh, a visa on arrival service for all African passport holders. And so if you hold an African passport, you don't need to apply for a visa. You can arrive at the airport and apply for the visa, you know, at the airport. And so this has taken away the hustle African business people experience traveling in and out of Ghana. And I can assure all the other countries that the sky has not fallen. We have not suddenly seen a huge influx into our country of, of undesirable people or anything. I mean, it's made business easier for people, other Africans are able to travel in and out easily. We can do the same for the whole continent, not only for people, but also for goods. We must open the opportunities of our economies to our people. And this will send the outflow of over $190 billion from the continent each year. African business people will reinvest their monies in the African economy. And technology is available for purchase. We must not see investors as only foreigners. Investors can be our own nationals or our neighbors. The Commonwealth of Nations is not an accident of history. It was constituted by a deliberate amalgamation of shared dreams, shared values, and our shared wealth, which we call our common world. That is why right here, right now, the change we seek ought to begin with us. In order for us to achieve the common good, we need to review our entire relationship and create opportunities for our common members in the area of trade, education, science, technology, cultural exchange, infrastructure, food and agriculture, security, energy, sports, and entertainment amongst others. And human resource is not a problem. Africa has great talent, vibrant, innovative, and dynamic young brains that are eager and ready to contribute to moving the continent's fortunes to the next level. We have a generation of millennials that have training and innovation to take up the baton of leadership. But we cannot achieve this without the equal and active participation of our women. What is required in Africa is investment. Investment in these young people to deploy their skills, their talents, and their innovativeness. Venture financing that allows the youth to transform their dreams and aspirations into multi-pound businesses. And this is beginning to happen. We're beginning to see young Africans 
who are using innovation and their talents are uh, uh, making uh, uh, building profitable businesses that are employing uh, uh, huge numbers of people. I was hoping to meet my friend Ashish Takane, but uh, unfortunately he couldn't make it. But I think it's one example of young Africans who uh, believe in their dreams and make, are making their dreams happen. Investment in social and economic infrastructure and manufacturing plants that add value to the natural resources available on our continent in order to expand the availability of good paying jobs, increase taxes collected by our states in order to further open up, up, up our countries for more investment and business is needed. In further to the common good, Europe should not set sometimes impossible limits intended solely to prevent Africans and other youth developed countries from accessing their markets. This happens a lot of the time. non tariff barriers are used to prevent exports into uh, some of the European markets. We must also pass laws and regulations that give opportunity to our people in Africa. Regulations like the content, uh, a local content law we passed in Ghana uh, when we made our oil fine, and happily we uh, took that from Nigeria. Nigeria had nobody to learn from when they discovered oil, and so they have experimented all the way. Everything they know, they learned themselves. <laughs> Magana found oil much later, and happily we had another brother who had an experience, both positive and negative, <laughs> in uh, how, how, how to uh, use your oil resources. And I must say that Nigeria was very forthcoming, not only in trying to give us a positive of what had come out of their oil industry, but also the negative, what we should avoid doing, what we shouldn't do. And so our main two countries, Nigeria and Norway, you know, were very good in helping Ghana put in the mechanisms to ensure that uh, we are counted properly for um, the bountiful blessing of, of oil. And so the local content uh, law in Ghana, for instance, was taken straight out of Nigeria's local content law. And um, I must say that the Oil companies working in Ghana were absolutely unhappy about it. And they got the ambassadors to protest that every time when we were passing that legislation. And I said, no, no, we're going to pass it. Most of your companies are working in Nigeria, and the local content laws are the same. And so if you can work in Nigeria with those local content laws, why can't you work in Ghana with the same laws? And so that's why they are resistant. We pull them, kicking, and struggling and we passed those laws. And I must say that between 2011 and 2015, when we began oil production, Ghanaian companies have earned in excess of $1 billion as a result of the local content laws that we passed. That is, indigenous Ghanaian companies have earned more than $1 billion uh, because of that law. I remember also um, the issue of oil revenue repatriation. We put in a law that said that if you export the oil, you must bring the revenue back. And then from, uh, 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 from the accounts you hold in our country, you can pay off your contractors and repatriate your profits. But at least that money comes back to show up the strength of the local currency. And again, uh, one big oil company said that they, uh, of course, they, they are, their turnover is bigger than our total GDP and so they see us as a small country, and so they said we're not ready to respect that. So they said, if you're not ready to respect it, please, that's the law, you can leave. Yeah. We're sure there are many other people who will, will, will take it up. And several companies, like operating in Ghana, EMI and all, agreed, and I want to look at me, and I'm going to for me to take down, but here they come back. I don't know if they've gotten a waiver on the repatriation of the foreign currency components back right there. We'll continue to follow, follow what happens. We shouldn't think that every foreign investor is interested in the development of our country. I mean, they come to make as much profit as they want. And so we must um, uh, look out for ourselves too. Ghana is to call the Gold Coast, and so there's a lot of gold in the country. Gold mining is one of our major um, uh, opportunities, and um, Ghana exports about 80 tons of gold a year, among the top 10 exporters of gold. And so, there was another experience with uh, uh, foreign investors. The gold price was increasing quite high. It went almost to $30,000, if you remember, some years back. 
and uh, we said, ah, well, you guys are getting a windfall in gold protection, and so let's introduce a windfall tax so that we can put some money away for the lean times. And they said, no, 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 our production costs are so high. You know, and we give all kinds of reasons for this costs are high. And so we're making there's a small margin on, on the gold. We have 200, 300 dollars. We have to pay royalties, we have to pay taxes. So we're eventually earning nothing. Foreign investors are earning nothing, and they're still there and mining, <laughs> you know. <laughs> then, you know what happened? The gold price had a and came from $3,000 to $2,200. If your production costs were so high, you were making only two hundred dollars at three thousand. You should be packing and leaving. And yet here they were asking me for tax breaks. When we get some tax breaks, you know the gold price is low. I said, oh, why are you making a windfall? And I said, pay some extra tax. Would I give it back to you in tax breaks when the price came down? You refuse to pay. But they're still there mining a thousand three hundred dollars per ton uh, per, per ounce. And yet, at 3,000, they said that they were not making any money. And so, the regulations to ensure that, you know, the natural resources Africa has, is just not an outward flow out of our countries into other places, but that they should change to create jobs in our countries so that our young people will not cross the Mediterranean and come and harass you here in Europe. Make your profit, but pay a fair price, pay a fair taxes and royalties so that Africa can generate jobs in Africa for African youth. And so these are issues that we must look out for. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I've set your minds thinking about a few issues under the theme, the common good, which we'll see further expanded on during various sessions over the past the next two days. There might be setbacks in our works, our work to achieve benefits for our common prosperity, but it must not deter us from continuing the struggle, because after all, the survival of mankind is a collective one. A section of the human race no section of the human race can survive in isolation. The world's resources are finite, and the only optimum <coughs> utilization we can achieve of these resources will be for it to be used for the common good of all mankind. I thank you, and I wish you a successful summit. What?